sir. And I guess I'll let everyone in if, uh, if you're ready. All right, cool. All right, people should be pouring in now. Way cool, way cool. Got a couple other people. There you go. Letting them all in. Greetings, everyone. Greetings. I know you guys are uh, just joining us now. Um, you know, thanks for coming. Uh, kind of as everybody's pouring in, um, if you want to put like your name, um, your region or county, um, and if you're working with an agency, uh, where you're at, just so uh, we can have a kind of a rough idea of who's in the audience today, right? That'd be cool. Just put it in the chat. Awesome. Family's on the moves here. That's always cool. Let's see here. Still letting in a couple more people. We'll give it another minute or two. Some, some more responses coming in the chat. Thanks so much, everyone. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started. And if anyone else pours in, we'll just let them in. Uh, so my name is Alex Carpenter. I'm the Western Region Youth Partner with Youth Power Families Together. Um, and for September, uh, we put together a series of presentations and workshops around different substance use disorder topics. Um, today's presentation is going to be facilitated by my good friend Ben Riker from YVM, Youth Voices Matter, part of Friends of Recovery New York. Uh, he'll be doing um, a presentation about the basics of harm reduction, right? Um, it's a super neat philosophy and thing to learn about. Um, so I'm really excited to have him here and presenting. Um, I'm going to turn it over to him and let him present. And then at the end, I've got a, an evaluation link I'll put in the chat. Um, and I think that's all I've got. Uh, so Ben, if you want to go ahead and take over and get started. Right on. Thanks, Alex. So it's great to be here. Uh, I always dig doing these things. Um, yeah, basically, uh, my name's Ben Riker. I am the Youth Recovery Program Coordinator with uh, for New York. So I oversee the Youth Voices Matter program. And really what we do, well, what we really do, I guess this year is we help, um, we help fund some other organizations around the state that are doing great work on the ground with young people. Um, we provide lots of different trainings. And uh, right now we're in the midst of the Youth Recovery Institute, which is uh, totally free. It's uh, the 46 hour core curriculum for state certification to become a certified recovery peer advocate. Um, so right now it's offered to 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, we have 18 or 20 people participating um, and we're going to do it again next year and we're going to bump that up to 40 or 50 participants and it's 100% free um, and we offer a whole bunch of support right through job placement. So if anybody has any interests uh, in, in, you know, maybe participating in that um, in the, you know, the next six months or so, be sure to send me an email. And I, I put my email in, uh, in the link or in the, uh, in the chat. So I want to talk about harm reduction today. And um, the presentation I'm doing is, it's really, uh, the, the curriculum was developed by the Drug Policy Alliance and they're a really cool advocacy organization. Um, and this curriculum has been used uh, in several New York City schools for the last couple of years. Um, and it's really geared towards like, uh, I guess I should say the PowerPoint is really geared towards like 16 to 18 or 19 year olds. Um, and I know that a lot of us in this room are a little older than that. So uh, you have to excuse like, you know, some of the imagery and stuff is definitely sort of high school imagery, but all of the um, all of the information is is sort of universal, you know, no matter what age we are. And if you're not familiar with harm reduction, um, it's really just a series of strategies to sort of mitigate um, mitigate the the negative consequences around 
Um, substance use. I think that we all know uh, that the reality is not everyone is going to be abstinent from all substances all the time. We're human beings um, and there's all kinds of factors that lead to us, you know, experimenting or, or um, you know, may potentially putting ourselves in risky situations. And, and the idea behind, um, you know, learning about harm reduction strategies and, and being able to implement them in our own lives is that um, you know, maybe we mitigate some of that, some of that risky stuff and some of the potentially harmful things that can come with, with experimenting um, with substances. So I'm going to launch the PowerPoint. Let's see, everybody see that okay? Can you see that, Alex? Looks good? Looks excellent, my friend. Right on. So this is actually a series of 14 lessons that are like between like 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes. And um, I really like this lesson too. I've delivered the whole series over the course of a couple of weeks several times. Um, but I really like lesson two because it really just gives us like this snapshot. And I think it's a good place to facilitate conversation. Uh, so I, as I go through this, um, I hope that we can really have a conversation. I, you know, I feel free to like, no need to raise your hand, no need, just unmute and talk. Um, I love to get interrupted. I love to be asked questions. Um, and I'd much rather that this was a conversation amongst all of us than kind of me uh, just running my mouth to all of you guys. Um, so keep that in mind. You know, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have thoughts to share, don't hesitate to unmute and, um, and share what you're thinking. All right. So again, this is safety first. And uh, Alex, I'll, I'll give you the link to this whole curriculum if you want. And if you want to share it um, post training with anybody that was registered, uh, that would be great. Yeah, I can do that. Cool. So basically, and we're not going to follow these like five minute rules and all this stuff at all. Um, we're just going to go through it as we see fit. So the idea is. Um, at the end of this, you're going to be able to identify what harm strategy, what harm reduction strategies um, look like. Um, so I guess we'll just kick it off. So does anybody have any idea what number one is? What's happening there? I'll just answer. That dude's putting on his seatbelt so that if he gets into a car accident. He might hurt himself, but he's not going to fly through the windshield, right? Um, in number two, she's picking out healthy, fresh food rather than eating like a candy bar so that she, you know, maintains um, a healthy body and feeds her mind, right? Number three, this dude's playing football and he puts on a helmet and he puts on pads so that when he gets hit hard, he doesn't land in the hospital, hopefully, right? So when we think about, you know, actually um, defining what harm reduction is, it's really what it says, right? We're trying to reduce the harm caused in potential situations that, you know, that could negatively impact our lives. So after we get done with this lesson, um, we should be able to define the term harm reduction, uh, identify key harm reduction strategies, identify the ways in which drug use may potentially be harmful, uh, including health-related harms, academic harms, our schoolwork, our, our, um, our jobs, legal harms. My pathway to recovery included uh, the legal system, right? I've spent time in jail. Um, I've spent time, lots of time on probation. Um, and it was really all the result of, of substance use coupled with, with some mental health challenges um, that I live with. And then our social emotional harm. So again, like using my own lived experience, um, you know, there were uh, so many relationships. I couldn't count how many relationships um, that I lost in my own journey to recovery as a result of, of um, my substance use, you know, as the result, as a result of the way I felt about myself, as a result of the way that I isolated, and as a result of the way that I treated other people, uh, both under the influence, um, and when people kind of had the, uh, 
a lot of people asked me to stop and stopping at the time, you know, wasn't really an option for me and I cut them out of my lives. And, and uh, you know, some of those relationships I've gotten back and some of them, I definitely haven't. So let's talk about why we use drugs. And again, like I know this is, this PowerPoint is geared, it says specifically to teens, but um, you know, this is really valuable for, for all of us, uh, specifically young people. So does anybody wanna um, have any thoughts around why we might potentially use drugs or alcohol? Well, I think some common ones right off the bat is curiosity. Like um, the reality is that sometimes we see people using alcohol and it looks fun, right? It's fun. Like people smoke pot and it can be fun. There's, we can't really deny that, that piece. Right. Um, and I want to know what that feels like to feel better, um, for a long time, drugs and alcohol, uh, relieved my pain, right. My emotional pain. Um, you know, I was, if I was lonely, um, those, those things worked, you know, they made me feel better. They made me feel better about myself. They made me feel like I could kind of get out of my, um, get out of my own body and, and, um, and experience some relief from anxiety and depression and all of those things to fit in, right? We go kick it at a party, we go to the bar, whatever it might be, and everybody's drinking, you know, and, and I don't want to be the only person that's not to improve performance. So, you know, I think that this really um, looks at um, specifically like anabolic steroids, um, as well as like, there's some, um, you know, there's some prescribed drugs like Ritalin, um, you know, that, that can potentially help our performance academically. Like I said, for fun, you know, sometimes it's, um, it's sort of, it feels like a relief or to be part of the crowd, or to be, um, you know, to not have to think about those things that bother us on a daily basis. So this, I don't think for me is super surprising, but the most frequently used drug um, among teens and young adults is alcohol, followed by marijuana, followed by misuse of prescription drugs, and tobacco. Um, one thing that is actually surprising to me. We're kind of inundated with all this media stuff about, you know, this is so bad and that's so bad. And oh my God, the kids today and like the young people today are like, you know, they're all <laughs> crazy, you know, drug users running around um, with no responsibility. But the reality is um, there's actually yet less drug use today than there was 20 years ago. Um, oops, I get, kind of gave away the answer. There's actually less drug use today than there was 20 years ago. Um, cigarettes and alcohol have both reached their lowest levels since people really, since like the fifties and sixties, it's pretty amazing. Um, use of any illicit drug other than pot has declined. So while we are seeing marijuana kind of like stay at the same level or rise a little bit, the use of every other drug has actually declined. Um, marijuana has declined among eighth and 10th graders, but held steady for 12th graders and that 12th graders up through about the age of 24, um, those numbers have stayed very similar. And then opioid misuse has declined in the last 15 or so years among 12th graders. I should say 11 to 15 years among 12th graders, um, which is great news. And I think a lot of that has to do with messaging about how dangerous opioids um, can be. And, you know, and we're learning about overdose and, and we hear all these stories on the news about, about overdose. Hey, Alex, I think there's three people in the waiting room. So I want to talk a little bit about what the continuum looks like. And we start with abstinence with folks who don't use any drugs and then experimental usage, recreational use, regular use, misuse, um, and then uh, substance dependence. And there's a couple of... Um, We'll see, oops, we'll see a couple of, of individuals with like little scenarios. So number one, Michelle felt, felt left out at the party. She took some MDMA or Molly when it was offered. Um, number two, Tim drinks alcohol only on Fridays and never when he has a soccer game the next day. 
Sarah misuses her morning coffee today. Now she has a headache, which seems kind of funny, but um, it's pretty wild when we look some of the data around caffeine. <laughs> I'm totally addicted to caffeine. Uh, Damon has friends who use drugs, but he's not interested. Grace only smokes cigarettes when she's at parties. Mateo takes double his prescribed dosage of Adderall before a test because he feels like it will help him focus more. So when we start popping these people into the continuum, um, you can kind of see where they land, which I don't love this slide. You kind of have to go back and forth with it. But like, if we look at this dude on the end, um, Damon, right? He's not using drugs at all. Um, Mateo is certainly misusing um, his prescribed Adderall. Um, let's see, Damon is, has friends who use drugs, but he's not interested. So it kind of just lays it out, like what it looks like. So for somebody who doesn't use drugs at all, you're just kind of way over there on the left-hand side. And for somebody that maybe can't stop using drugs or, um, you know, skips their morning coffee, right? When they drink five cups of coffee a day and then skip your coffee and you get a headache, um, that's a sign of dependence on, on that particular drug. And even though coffee is the example, um, you know, those signs of withdrawal, um, specifically with, with alcohol and opioids can become really, really powerful um, drivers of, of problematic use and dependence. So this is a big one for me. Um, people who use drugs aren't bad people. Um, this is something that I really struggled with in my life, um, you know, feelings of shame around um, my relationship with drugs and alcohol, you know, and I could look at other people around me who were using and misusing substances and think to myself, wow, you know, these are terrible people. And then look in the mirror and say, well, I'm one of them too, you know? And I come from a family where, um, where substance use dependence or addiction was like, you know, that was a choice that you made. There was no, you know, if you can't just control yourself, um, you're not a good person and we don't want you around. And that was kind of driven into me for a long, long time. And, you know, today I recognize that um, the reasons that people misuse substances are uh, kind of run the gamut, right? Uh, that to feel better piece, you know, it might start um, to feel better. And then all of a sudden we find that, that we're dependent. And, um, you know, while my behavior um, was not, my behavior for a long time uh, as a person who was actively using drugs um, was not admirable in any way, I was still the same person. And a lot of that was the fact that, you know, I was emotionally, physically, um, I was in a bad place. I was hurting, you know, and uh, to begin with, drugs and alcohol kind of gave me some relief from that. But I, at my core, was never a bad person. I just made some really bad choices. So drug-related harms. Um, basically, for, for youth and young adults, um, they break down into four pretty distinct areas. Um, the physical harms, academic harms, like we mentioned, social, emotional stuff, and legal stuff. Um, and you can totally see in this picture uh, that I've like been there on that toilet where she is and it's not a happy place, not a happy place to be. So, you know, the physical harms, we can find ourselves in a place of, of dependence. Um, we can certainly find ourselves in a place where we're physically damaging um, our organs, you know, um, even smoking cigarettes. I mean, Alex and I had a conversation about nicotine before everybody was in the room and, uh, you know, I'm practicing harm reduction as we speak. I, I was a smoker for a long time. Um, my motivation to stop smoking was the fact that I was having trouble breathing when I wanted to go mountain biking or go running or do anything. Um, I finally stopped smoking, but I started using a jewel and, um, you know, I thought, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not burning tobacco and inhaling it. Uh, the reality was I ended up using a jewel more often than I was actually smoking cigarettes because I'd use it in the house and my use it in the car. My clothes would never smell like cigarettes. I could use it whenever. And it was really hard to quit. And so now I'm, I'm using 
Nicorette lozenges, you know, and they're super unsatisfying and it's really hard to quit. And, you know, I think about starting smoking being one of the worst decisions of my life, but I can certainly tell you like my ability to like, when I am an active smoker, my ability to, to exercise, my ability to like walk upstairs. Like I know that I'm damaging my lungs. Accidental injury or death. Um, certainly driving behind the wheel or riding with somebody who's, who's, um, under the influence of alcohol is, is, uh, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of young people die every year, um, as a result of drunk driving, as well as if you go to the bottom overdose, overdose death. Um, my youngest cousin, I'm one of, uh, 11 first cousins and then like a bunch more second cousins, but my youngest first cousin who turned 24, uh, would have turned 24, uh, about six weeks ago passed away the day before his birthday of a, of an accidental overdose. Um, and I'd worked with him, you know, as both as his, as a family member and as a person in recovery, just trying to support him in his, in his journey. But he passed away, uh, and his, my aunt and uncle found him in his bed at three in the morning. And, um, there was Narcan, uh, right next to his bed. Um, so overdose death happens. Um, there are families a lot of loss all across New York. Um, it didn't need to happen. Completely preventable, preventable death, but he wasn't practicing those things um, that we talked about on a daily basis. Transmission of disease, um, certainly with intravenous drug use, um, we can we can um, contract Hep C. We contract we can contract HIV. Um, but then there's also instances where you know, we overuse alcohol and make poor decisions and end up um, with a sexually transmitted disease. And again, on to sexual assault, you know, we can, um, if we use too much of a substance, uh, whether it's alcohol or an opiate, or, um, you know, we're, we leave ourselves vulnerable, um, whether it's by passing out or, or again, just making poor decisions um, to sexual assault, which is really serious stuff. Academic harm, suspended, oops, suspended or expelled from school, um, removed from athletic teams. I actually got a scholarship um, to ski race at the University of Vermont, Division I scholarship as a, I, I placed um, third in the Empire State Games um, as a high schooler. I got a full ride scholarship and I lost my scholarship after my third positive drug screen for cocaine. Um, so I, you know, at that time, I really defined myself by, you know, that athletic um, success that I had had, even though, you know, I was a daily, um, daily drinker and a daily user, I, my self-worth really um, was, was linked with my ability, you know, to do this one thing really, really well, something that nobody could take away from me, but it was taken away from me. Uh, I shouldn't say it was taken away from me. My behavior uh, uh, resulted in, you know, losing my scholarship and it really changed the course of my life all the way to today. Denied entrance into college, refused scholarships and federal student loans. So that federal student loan one, um, really, if, if you're arrested uh, with a felony, uh, drug conviction, it can affect your ability to get a student loan. So I did it again. Legal harms, um, fines. So I happen to have four, four DWIs. And at one point in early recovery, um, I started to do the math on how much money I had spent on lawyers, on fines, on probation fees, on, uh, you know, all the things associated with all of those DWIs. And it was over $45,000, um, like total insanity. Um, and my last DWI was now eight years ago. And I just finished paying everything off about 18 months ago. Um, so that it, shit is real, excuse my language. It's real and it hurts. Um, community service, mandatory classes. I can't tell you how many mandatory classes I've been in. Um, and arrests and juvenile detention potential for detention centers or jail. Social and emotional harms. Um, and this is a big one for me again. And I, you know, if anybody has any, if anybody wants to chime in, please, please do. Um, I know that I share my experience only because that's the only experience that I have. Um, I'm only a, uh, 
I'm only an expert in my own experience. So that's what I share, but I would love if anybody has any thoughts on any of this stuff, but the social emotional harms, um, you know, my, a lot of my, my uh, alcohol and drug misuse surrounded um, my feelings of depression and anxiety that I couldn't really define at the time. Um, but invariably, uh, my use made those things worse, you know, in the midst of, of drinking or, or using or being high, um, those things kind of went away. And then in the morning, those things doubled down and were much worse than they were before I used. And um, in feeling much worse, I would pick up again uh, and just start the cycle all over. Um, and I think in talking to a lot of people who had similar experiences, I think that um, I'm not unique like that. Conflicts with friends, family, or teachers. I talked about that in the beginning, you know, the relationships that, that we use as a result of maybe our behavior uh, while we're under the influence or decisions that we make and families being split apart, which I can also identify with. Any thoughts, anybody? Anybody wanna share anything? So harm reduction is a set of strategies that encourage the safest and healthiest choice. So they're showing those pictures again um, from the very beginning of the slideshow. The dude putting his seatbelt on, the lady you know, picking out that super delicious looking red pepper and this dude, you know, with a football helmet. Oops, I'm not, there we go. All right, we're gonna talk about harm reduction in action. Uh, so situation one, Matt paces himself by drinking one glass of water for every alcoholic beverage he drinks. Throw it in the chat, is he practicing harm reduction? Who thinks he's practicing harm reduction? Yes, yes, yep, lots of yeses for sure, right? How about Lisa? Lisa's stressed out about a test. So she goes to hang out with her friends and smokes a bunch of pot to relax. How about Lisa? Is she practicing harm reduction? You think so? I like Julie's answer. So I'm gonna say, well, let's go on to the third one and we'll talk about it. Maria had a few drinks at a party, plans to drink some coffee so that she's not too drunk before driving home. What do you think? Joanna says, nope. Julie says, nope. <laughs> right. She's not practicing harm reduction. That's a myth. Coffee does not sober you up. So Matt, for sure. So the answer here for the PowerPoint is no. Um, but maybe Julie wants to chime in. And the answer, obviously, for the dr drinking and driving. Julie, do you want to chime in and share what you're thinking when you said it depends. And Alex, yeah, I think totally trying to practice harm reduction, but has bad information. Absolutely. Julie or Tiara? I'm sorry, you're popping up as Julie on the, there's two Julies in the room. Tiara, you must have Julie. You signed in as Julie. Yeah, yeah, Tiara. I think you're signed in as um as this Julie here. Oh, I don't know how. <laughs> um, well, it depends. I say it depends because it depends. Like, does she do any other substances, right? So, like, let's say she usually drinks before a test, and maybe she's been kicked out of class before for being intoxicated. But now it's like, you know what? Let me reduce that level of, I guess, educational harm as your, or academic harm and do something less harm, what she might seem to be less harmful to her. So that was like what I was thinking about. Like, it depends. Yeah, I agree completely, Tiara, for sure. No doubt. Um, and I, you know, I, that kind of jumped out, jumped out at me the first time that I went through this curriculum. Um, 
and there's all kinds of like we have all kinds of ideas about you know um and data about what's more harmful alcohol or marijuana and you know i'm certainly of of the school that alcohol is extremely harmful um potential to be extremely harmful um and i know that there i have friends um who practice a harm reduction program that includes marijuana um so i agree 100 percent yeah i actually have something to add to that sure um personally as someone who used to be involved with many many substances um marijuana was basically the one thing that made it easier to not do everything else because in situations where normally I would be doing cough syrup or Adderall or anything like that. I would just like smoke a joint and then go to sleep. And then I would have avoided causing harm to my body that I would have done otherwise, you know? Absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. Is it Valek? Yes. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Valek. Um, you know, what our recovery looks like is really our own, you know? And, and we are, again, back to that continuum. All of us are on a continuum um, of what, you know, what our, if, if our recovery looks like purely a program of harm reduction, that's okay. That's where we are at this minute. Um, and it sounds like, you know, in those instances, you're practicing a program of harm reduction. And I have uh, all the respect in the world for that, you know, but we do, I think it's also important that we understand the risks involved um, with all of those behaviors, right? Like the risks involved with using cough syrup, misusing cough syrup, or the risks involved with using heroin or, or fentanyl. Um, uh, as long as we're making the right decision for ourselves, I think, um, I think that we're on the right track. And it's like, there's a lot of data now that we're seeing. So for instance, um, you know, a lot of folks who practice harm reduction, um, use needle exchange programs, right? To avoid those physical harms like um, diseases or infection. Um, and we're seeing now that folks who engage with a community-based needle exchange program are five times more likely to be practicing a program of total abstinence within five years. Um, so the, that behavior where, you know, the old thinking would suggest that, um, engaging in a needle exchange program is sort of enabling someone's um, bad behavior or um, not stellar behavior. The reality is that that's a change behavior, you know, saying, okay, I'm not going to use um, a contaminated needle. I'm going to participate in this exchange program so that although, you know, I haven't made that choice um, to set down uh, my drug of choice um, today, uh, I'm moving in a direction that suggests I, I, I'm willing to make changes. And that's a really powerful thing. Thoughts on, on any of that stuff, guys? All right. So as far as strategies go, we were just talking about abstinence, right? Like, Obviously, the most effective harm reduction strategy is to not to not use substances at all. Um, however, we also know that that's not very realistic for a lot of us. Um, part two, I was just talking about this. You know, know what you're doing and know what the potential risks and consequences are around the substances that we might be experimenting with, or the substances we might be misusing. So, dose and dosage. Um, we're going to talk about all these things in the next couple of slides, so I'm just going to go through them. Start low and go slow and consider moderation. Set and setting. This is a big one um, that, that I actually love. Uh, check the substance. Don't mix substances. This is huge. And know how to respond to an emergency. Um, so abstinence, it's always safest not to use, oops, it's always safest not to use alcohol or other drugs. So if safety is our number one factor, what is the safest thing we can do? Don't pick up, develop drug knowledge. So like I said, everyone needs to know the basic risks, the effects and the benefits and harms of what we're using. Dose and dosage, how much, how often? Um, so if we might be misusing pres prescription drugs like in this picture, um, 
we have to have an understanding that if we use too much too quickly, uh, the results could be potentially fatal, right? So start low and go slow. You know, if we don't understand dose and dosage um, and we're going to make that decision to put something into our body that we don't necessarily understand uh, or we don't have a great understanding of, um, start low, use a small amount and go um, very slowly. See how, see how you react both, both physically and mentally uh, to whatever that substance is before you take more. Consider moderation. Uh, this picture of a massive thing of cigarette butts like reminds me of every coffee table in my house as, um, as a person who is actively using. Um, kind of grosses me out. Uh, but the idea, you know, my, sorry, my dogs are freaking out. The idea of moderation management is actually, one second. Sorry. <laughs> the idea of moderation management is actually a pathway of recovery. You know, there's a lot of people, um, as much as we don't hear in AA meetings or NA meetings, um, there are lots of people who successfully change their pattern of use from a pattern of misuse um, to a pattern of moderation. Um, that's real, it happens. Um, that wasn't my experience necessarily. Um, but it does happen, and some people are able to, uh, to moderate their problem. Um, so this refers to your thoughts and emotions. The set refers to, you know, how are you feeling? Where's your head at? Um, are you emotionally okay? And the setting refers to, like, where are you? Where, where are you physically? Are you in a place um, where there's the potential for sexual assault? Or are you in a place where there's the potential for you know, somebody um, just physically assaulting you? Um, are you getting into a car with someone who has been drinking? So being aware of, of how you feel, you know, have you, were you up all night the night before and um, you're going to, to drink a, you know, a whole bottle of liquor, you might be affected way differently, um, you know, having a few beers or, or having a few drinks if you haven't slept or you haven't eaten in days. So taking an invent a personal inventory of where you're at, you know, physically and emotionally, um, and taking that into account as to how substances might, um, might affect you. And then looking around, you know, are you with friends? Are you with people you know, people that care about you? Um, that may be a safer setting than maybe if you're alone or, or with one friend at a bar you've never been to in a city you've never been to. So check the substance, you know, go, first of all, Google it. What is it that I'm putting in my body? You know, check it out, see what it is. Um, on the other end of that, um, if, if you are using um, illicit substances, um, most recovery centers now, uh, a lot of prevention agencies have fentanyl test strips. So you can check to make sure that that, that, that you know, molly that you're taking doesn't actually have fentanyl in it. Uh, that, that ecstasy that you're taking doesn't actually have fentanyl in it or that heroin that you're using doesn't have fentanyl, fentanyl in it. Um, so it's important that kind of do a little research and make sure that you know what you're putting in your body. Don't mix substances. So this is a huge one. You know, one um, uh, from like a, I was actually prescribed benzodiazepines as a result of a, of a um, mental health diagnosis. And nobody ever told me um, that, you know, upwards of eight and 10 fatal overdoses in, in, for fentanyl or opiates, um, there's actually benzodiazepines in the system. And that, it goes for alcohol too. Anytime that you mix a downer with an opiate, um, the results can be um, potentially be fatal. So, you know, whether you're using a prescribed benzodiazepine uh, or an unprescribed benzodiazepine recreationally, um, it's important that we understand that when we put um, like, and it's just an example, but when we put benzos um, in our body with opiates, um, our potential for fatal overdose uh, really goes through the roof. So having an understanding of that stuff and just remembering that um, anytime we mix substances, the, the results, the negative results can really easily be compounded. Um, can I add something to that? I'm sorry. Of course. One thing, I don't know if this is more just a personal experience thing, but another thing that I don't think is talked about a lot with mixing substances is sometimes the, like, I don't want, I'm hesitant to call it like positive effects, but sometimes mixing substances can make 
things that aren't usually addictive even more addictive than they would be on their own because my unfortunate experience was I actually became addicted to LSD because I was mixing it with cough syrup and that completely changed the nature of both substances when normally LSD is not addictive on its own. Sure, absolutely. So again, like having an understanding of what we're putting in our bodies and how that reacts with other things that we're putting in our bodies is really important for sure. Thanks, Vilek. So knowing how to respond to an emergency, um, I would encourage everyone on this call, if you haven't already, um, to go to your local recovery center or get online and, and look around and, and find an op op opioid overdose response training. So in that training, you get Narcan and you learn how to administer it. Um, you also in that training, or you should learn in that training, um, you know, you should understand the basics of CPR. It's not a CPR training, but you know, understand the basics of, of how to give rescue breaths. And also um, to understand the way that um, Good Samaritan laws work and specifically in New York State. Um, and I'd love to talk a lot more about both op opioid op overdose response training and Good Samaritan laws. But if you're unfamiliar, basically the gist is um, if you're in a place where there are drugs or alcohol and someone overdoses on either drugs or alcohol, um, you can call 911 and no one in that space uh, will be arrested for possession. Um, and that's a, it's really important. I've been in situations um, not knowing uh, that, that that was the case, but um, I would encourage you all to do a little more research on New York State Good Samaritan Laws or go take an opioid, opioid overdose response training uh, if there's one in your area, for sure. And then uh, knowing drug policy. So there's all kinds of conversations to have around, around drug policy, but um, the main one is, you know, for me, the main one is um, the only policy that I really, I think like talking about my cousin's death, you know, I think about, I'm gonna stop sharing because we don't generally, I don't generally go into these, hold on. So um, the only drug policy that really matters to me, I think from the perspective of um, folks who are still using drugs is, um, is this harm reduction piece. I think that every overdose death is a failure in policy. Um, I mean, we could, I could go on for days and days around, around policy and the failed drug war and, and the way that um, the drug war affects um, people of color and poor people uh, in ways that is um, just completely uh, obscene, I think. Um, but the real takeaway when it comes to policy is, is um, the fact that overdose deaths are preventable. And uh, if we're not, uh, from a policy perspective, embracing harm reduction strategies, then uh, we're essentially, um, I think we're essentially killing people. So so that's kind of my spiel. Um, there are a couple at the end of, there's a couple of um, scenarios, but they do take a little bit of time. And we have about 15 minutes left. And I just wanted to have an opportunity to chat about some of this stuff if anybody wanted to. Um, and I don't think anything in the scenarios is anything that I haven't really talked about already. Um, it's really pretty basic stuff. So any thoughts, any comments? Well, one thing that I wanted to say is I feel like the two aspects, I can't remember which like list they weren't exactly, but two of the numbered things that you had, like the drug knowledge and the moderation piece, I feel like those go hand in hand a lot as well because some, I feel like some drugs can be socialized, social and moderated, such as like weed or even alcohol in very specific situations for some people. Like, obviously, some people shouldn't be touching anything because they just can't, it's, they just can't handle it. And it's not good for them health wise. I feel like occasionally using weed or occasionally having a drink is perfectly fine. 
in most situations, but like you can't exactly moderate heroin or meth or other substances like that, you know? Yeah. So there's, there's, for me, there's kind of two parts to that. I, I, I agree with you a hundred percent that, you know, there's m not everyone who picks up a, um, any substance is automatically going to have a problematic relationship with that substance. Um, but we do have to understand that uh, quite often, if there's a co-occurring mental health disorder, um, that can be exacerbated by uh, the use of substances, not always, can be. And I think that we have to be able to take, you know, at, to be able to take an inventory of our own situation and, and look at what how we respond to substances as individuals um, and how we respond to, um, you know, how do we check ourselves? When do we know that our relationship with us, with maybe alcohol is becoming problematic? Are the consequences of our behavior while we're under the influence of alcohol or anything else, are they harmful to all of those things we talked about, our relationships? Are they harmful to our academics or our job or, our employability, are they, harm, are they more harmful to our mental health? Um, and I think I would beg to differ a little bit because um, I think that there are instances uh, where very um, quote unquote addictive substances, um, there are people who do use those substances in moderation. I'm not one of them. Um, the, those of us that land in treatment, um, probably most of us are not folks who can moderate our use of things like methamphetamine or, or uh, heroin or cocaine. However, um, I'm very hesitant to, to just automatically put those things into a box and say, you know, um, that there's zero benefit ever for anyone. So uh, I appreciate I, I appreciate your perspective, and I think you and I are almost on the exact same page. Well, the main reason I mentioned that is just because I feel like the traditional, like, dare, dare style of drug education kind of teaches people that, you know, substance abuse is substance abuse, or using a substance is the same across the board, you know, like, all drugs are the same, all users are the same, you know, in reality, that is not the case at all. You're absolutely right. There's actually been some kind of nutty data around um, participants in DARE programs across the country. And um, some of the data is now suggesting that if you participated in a DARE program, you're actually more likely to develop an SUD later in life, which I think is um, a little bizarre. Uh, the other piece of that is that those DARE programs quite often come out of that 90s, just say no um, mentality where, uh, you know, this it's all based around fear. You know, we're stoking fear and it's like, I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember um, the egg in the frying pan commercials. This is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Um, and it was sort of that thing like, you know, if I do this thing, uh, my brain will never be the same, right? I'm, I've ruined my life. And we know now that uh, the brain has an incredible ability to heal itself, you know, when we take away that substance and, and we enter recovery, you know, over time, um, our brain develops new pathways and, and uh, has a really amazing ability, um, you know, to, we have the ability to get well. Um, it's not like the egg actually can go back in the shell. So um, I think a lot of those, a lot of that stuff was, you know, whether it's dare or whether it was some of those like 80s and 90s, like, um, media campaigns were really based on on fear rather than having knowledge and becky mentioned we have a gray area in terms like california sober which she finds really interesting um and i do too becky i think that um it's it's kind of like Valek, what Valek was talking about that you know uh, so recovery looks different for for everyone and if we can define those things uh, in our lives that are harmful, um, then you know potentially we have the ability to to maybe use marijuana responsibly, but but choose not to use alcohol, right? Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that as long as we're we're being honest with ourselves and 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 taking that personal inventory and making sure that um, we're making good 
you know, good choices. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through the through the uh, chat here to see what I missed. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Alex, Tierra. I have a thought, or I guess since we've got a few extra minutes, if you don't mind, I certainly would like um, kind of like an opinion or thought piece from you. So um, as the harm reduction model is kind of being practiced more and more widely across the country and the state, um, we've seen things like uh, safe injection sites pop up um, near needle um, exchange programs. Um, there's lots of people who are really hesitant about things like safe injection sites and also kind of seeing it as an enabling thing um, and you mentioned the participation in needle exchange programs affecting long-term recovery. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if you have any thoughts or opinions or if Youth Voices Matter for New York has any thoughts or opinions um, about safe injection sites and what you would say to anyone who is kind of wondering, you know, why they should support something like that, especially in their neighborhood. So the first thing I would say was that we have feelings about all of this stuff that's controversial, but those feelings are almost 100% of the time informed by our biases, right? Like we have biases that we develop around, whether it's around mental health or substance use or alcohol use or anything else. Um, and those feelings are not almost ever based on data. So the reality around safe injection sites, we can look to countries all over the world that are doing this. We can look to Portugal, we can look um, to some, some like Norway and some Scandinavian countries who like, if we look at Portugal, I think, I don't remember the years exactly. It was like 2016, they had, it's a small country, but they had like 1100 and change fatal overdoses. Uh, they implemented these safe injection sites. The following year, they had like two or three fatal overdoses. Um, and the reality around that is that dead people can't recover, right? Um, period. You know, I'm, I'm a person who is lucky enough to find recovery before I died. And now I'm lucky enough to help. You know, I spent five years as a, as a recovery peer advocate. Sorry, my dog is like whining in the corner, <laughs> rubbing on the couch. Um, but I'm lucky enough, you know, I spent all these years as a recovery peer advocate, literally sending people to treatment on a daily basis. And had I died, you know, it's not like maybe somebody else wouldn't have been there sending someone to treatment, but I've done so much good um, because um, I found recovery, right? Like my life has this, this purpose that I didn't have before. Um, so, you know, I would just say that we can look at the data um, where there are safe injection sites, people don't die. People aren't dying. People are, are getting um, substances that they know are not poisoned with fentanyl, which I will mention that our recreational drug supply right now is poisoned. It's not safe. Um, so we have like, I've seen Schenectady County numbers, which is north of me. Um, they had 50 something fatal overdoses or 61 fatal overdoses last year. More than half of those, there was zero fatal overdoses from heroin. Um, it was all, every one of them was fentanyl. Um, more than half of them were not intended to, did not intend to take an opiate. So they were fake benzodiazepines, Xanax bars that had fentanyl in them. They were crack cocaine that was laced yeah. with fentanyl. Yeah. They were more than half of fatal overdoses were not even intended to be used um, by a person who the person didn't think they were taking an opiate. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I'm a supporter of safe injection sites and I speak for myself personally. Uh, I hesitate to speak for um, my organization as a whole, but uh, I know the individuals within my organization feel the same way as I do. And um, when you talk about our neighborhoods, um, you know, I welcome a safe injection site rather than someone openly using on a park bench. So, um, and like when you look at homeless shelters or recovery center, like homeless shelters, people say, well, I don't want that in my neighborhood. The reality, again, when we look at data is that neighborhoods that um, get a homeless shelter within five years, 
the property values in that neighborhood go up by an average of 11% because now we don't have folks who are, who are sleeping on our streets, right? We have, we're taking care of the people in our communities um, and our property values reflect, reflect that. So just because I feel like, oh, I'm gonna have a homeless shelter next door, my house isn't gonna be worth anything, the data is, doesn't care what your feelings are. You know, the data suggests something different. So Tiara, did I answer your question? I think so. I thought that was great. Thank you so much, very wise. I saw your hand up, Tiara. Hello? Yeah. Okay, here we go. I, I was on mute. So I was wondering if you could go a little bit into, um, so for instance, like we, based on your presentation and things that we know or things that we learned today, we know that like harm reduction is a public health approach, right? And it definitely, it works, right? Like research shows that it works. What about when I work inside of a facility as an advocate, or even if I'm going to seek treatment for myself in the place I work, they don't quite understand harm reduction or they don't support it. Cause we know a lot of times we can work in places and people have their own opinions, which seep through how they provide services. And one thing about harm reduction, what I love about it is it treats people with respect, right? So if I'm an advocate, how, what advice would you give advocates or even social workers on this call right now on how to approach coworkers or even introduce the concept of harm reduction or this model of harm reduction in their workplace or in their personal lives when they're getting treatment? And kind of tagging along to TR's question, I think that's actually a really good one, especially because it seems like most of your traditional treatment centers have an abstinence only focus, yep. whereas otherwise you're in violation or whatever. Um, and medication assisted treatment seems to be the furthest uh, harm reduction tactic they're willing to go. So when we look at state policy, like quote unquote, the actual policy that Oasis kind of hands down uh, to its treatment centers, it's not reflective of the services that treatment centers are providing. So policy would suggest that all treatment centers in New York state embrace a harm reduction approach. Um, the reality is we have the average age of a CASAC in New York state or of a social worker in these programs is you know, they were providing services in the late 80s and early 90s, and they're still there. Um, so trying to teach that proverbial old dog new tricks is is tough. Um, if we're a certified recovery peer advocate, say, and I know that, you know, we have mental health advocates, but part of our role, if we look at the, com the, the core competencies, is that of an educator. We're, we're, it's our ethical responsibility to share our lived experience and the, and the experiences that we've come while providing services in community about how these how these programs work you know to be able to take those success stories and illustrate them to the people that we're working with who may not be really be on board yet so i mean there's lots of great trainings around like what recovery looks like today i mean you can if you go to four dash not to plug for new york but four dash ny dot uh, org forward slash trainings is you know i will come to your organization i will come to your treatment center and we'll talk about harm reduction and we'll talk about not only the science of addiction, but the science of addiction and recovery, right? We'll talk about, um, so I would say, you know, that capital A advocate, um, part of your ethical responsibility as an advocate is to um, come up with, you know, to arm yourself with data, come up with um, a way to um, share that data in a digestible manner in 90 seconds, right? You have a conversation, talk about, um, you know, those numbers that when somebody uses um, a needle exchange program, they're five more times, five times more likely um, to, to be practicing a program uh, of abstinence within a period of time. The second piece is um, a lot of it revolves around language. Those people who are, who are, um, resistant to embracing harm reduction are the same people that still refer to um, substance use disorder. A person with a substance use disorder is an addict, right? Or substance abuse rather than substance misuse or substance use disorder. There's a great uh, website. Um, there's a really cool organization 
it's a partnership between Harvard Med School and um, Mass General, and it's called the Recovery Research Institute. And the guy who leads it is um, Dr. John Kelly, and he's a Harvard professor. And we're finally seeing some of this amazing data. And the website is recoveryanswers.org, um, but I would encourage everybody to go look at it. But one of the studies that they did, um, they asked a large number of people um, if a person with uh, if a person was an addict, do they deserve to go to jail or do they deserve to go to treatment? And it was a little more complicated. I'm simplifying it, but it was something like seven in ten people said an addict deserves to go to jail. When they changed it up, the language, and they said we have a person with a substance use disorder, do they deserve to go to jail or do they deserve to go to treatment? Those numbers almost flipped. It was like seventy percent said they deserve treatment, and it was the same when we talked about substance abuse versus substance use disorder. If you said this person is a substance abuser, that and then there was other things like. If you use the term abuser or addict, that person was like seven in 10 people said they were most likely dangerous. Seven in 10 people said they were most likely thieves. Seven in 10, but when we changed it and said this person has an SUD, um, those numbers almost flipped on their heads. So Tiara, the other piece of that is if we're in an agency where the culture hasn't caught up with the science, we can do our part by using recovery positive language, by using person first language, and, and by, you know, taking any opportunity that we have to share those things that we know and share that data that we've armed ourselves with um, and share the success stories. Wow, Thank thanks. Um, so uh, I know we're just a little past our time. Um, unless Ben has a hard stop, you can continue to ask him questions. <laughs> uh in the chat box though i've posted a forms link it's our evaluation for for the presentation today um those of you who work at agencies and have done presentations know um you know how much we would really appreciate you guys filling it out uh those of you who don't know uh take my word for it your feedback is so very valued by us um so please uh fill out the evaluation form i'll put it in the chat again right now um if you have any questions for Ben outside of the meeting, um, his email address, actually, he will be typing his email address in the chat box if he doesn't mind real quick. Yeah. And, uh, um, and we really appreciate you guys joining us today, right? Um, I do want to give a plug. Uh, I put it in the chat kind of while Ben was talking about it. So earlier, you know, Ben had mentioned some of the improportionate effects systems policy has had on the BIPOC community. Uh, check out our presentation Friday. Uh, my coworker Charles is going to do a super neat one about the BIPOC community and substance use disorder in the juvenile justice system, which is uh, kind of some of the improportionate impact uh, Ben was referring to, right? Um, so check us out Friday. The registration link is in the same email as the where uh, you got this one. Um, we really appreciate you guys filling out the survey and coming today. Um, and I hope to see you guys Friday for our last presentation of the month. Thank you. See you guys. All right, Alex, I'll catch you on the flip, brother. All right, catch you on the flip, man. Thank you so much for today. Yeah, you bet. Later. Later.